Genetics, biology is math. I find it useful to associate a lot of topics in genetics with ratios, so there are a lot of those in this video, as well as a decent amount of probability. Part one is your run of the mill crosses with deviations from that, like gene interaction and lethal alleles, so let's begin. Okay, I'm going to be talking a lot about bunnies today. It often helps to have a visual representation when learning genetics, so that's why. I also figured I'd spare you all from the horrors of my artwork, so I had one of the kids draw this for me. Don't you like their sparkly eyes? So anyway, red is dominant, capital B, and white is recessive, lowercase b. Both of these are homozygous individuals, and if you cross them together, you'd get a heterozygous red bunny. Right, basic stuff. Here's some more basics, but it's good review. The monohybrid cross produces a 3 to 1 ratio of red to white. All of these ratios that I have as slide headings, by the way, will refer to phenotype ratios, not genotype. Uh, but just for this one, here's how the genotypes break down, just to illustrate the difference between genotype and phenotype. But for this video and genetics in general, we're really only concerned with phenotype. Next up is the test cross, which is when you cross an individual of unknown genotype but dominant phenotype with a homozygous recessive in order to determine that unknown genotype. There are two outcomes to the test cross. Either you get a one-to-one -one ratio of red to white, or you get all red. If you get one-to-one, -one, then that means the unknown was heterozygous. If you get all red, that means the individual was homozygous dominant. Okay, now we have the dihybrid cross, which is when stuff finally starts to get interesting. So these bunnies aren't just red and white, they can be either giant or normal size as well, with giant being dominant. These two giant red bunnies are dihybrids, that is, they are heterozygous for both color and size. When you cross them together, you get a classic 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 phenotype ratio, which is given by this chart. Here's how it breaks down. All nine of these will be red and giant. These three will be white and giant. These three will be red and normal sized, while just this one will be homozygous recessive for both traits. It'll be white and normal sized. Now, on the MCAT, taking the time to construct this chart is a bad idea. It takes forever, and there are some shortcuts you can take. The first is to realize that you can look at a dihybrid cross as the product of the two individual monohybrid crosses. Want to know the fraction of red normal sized bunnies? Multiply the chance for red by the chance for normal sized to get 3 16 Red and giant? 3 quarters times 3 quarters is 9 sixteenths, and so on. The numerators all correspond to the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. This is especially useful if you have to consider more than two traits. For instance, let's say that these bunnies can also be fluffy or not fluffy, and have long ears or short ears. Fluffy bunnies are dominant, as are those with long ears. Now if I cross these two bunnies, what fraction of their offspring would be red, giant, fluffy, and have long ears? Just determine what the fractions are for each individual trait and multiply them all together. So all the bunnies will be red and giant, three quarters will be fluffy, and half will have long ears. Multiplying those all together shows us that three eighths of the offspring will be red, giant, fluffy, and long eared. You can do the same sort of analysis for genotypes as well. Go ahead and figure out what fraction of offspring will have this genotype. Pause the video while you work, or if you're good on this topic, just let it keep playing. Pause now if you care to. Otherwise, here's the answer. Half will be heterozygous for color, half homozygous dominant for size, a quarter won't be fluffy, and half will be heterozygous for ear length, giving us 1 out of 32 offspring. Definitely learn this, as the chart I created for dihybrid simply isn't viable for four traits. It would have 256 boxes on it, so maybe if you finish the bio section early and don't want to leave the test center yet, you can make one. Otherwise, don't do it. Do this method instead. It's much faster. Okay, now we're getting into deviations from the normal dihybrid cross. In this particular case, a ratio of 9 to 7 is obtained. This is an example of gene interaction. So these bunnies are dihybrids, but we're no longer talking about size, just coat color. They are dihybrid for coat color. Now, as often is the case in nature, there is more than one gene coding for a certain trait. For example, humans have several genes for height, which is why we get a bell curve rather than simply tall people and short people like Mendel's pea plants. So as you can see, the 3 to 3 to 1 have all added together to give 7, which explains the ratio. But how do you explain why they would all become white like that? The genes must be interacting. 
That doesn't mean that the genes are linked, just that they interact in the same pathway, like this one. To get from precursor X to precursor Y, at least one dominant B1 allele is needed. The same goes for getting from precursor Y to the red color. In either case, at least one copy of the dominant B1 or B2 allele is needed to produce the red color. This is consistent with the 9 to 7 ratio that we see. If the pathway cannot proceed for any reason due to homozygous recessive B1 or B2, then by default the bunny will be white. Recessive epistasis is a form of gene interaction and gives a 9 to 3 to 4 ratio when dihybrids are crossed. As you might imagine, one of the three is combined with the one, and we now have three co-colors. I'll add a blue bunny, as it was recently the 4th of July. They're patriotic bunnies. Now, pause the video here if you'd like to figure out this path on your own before I give you the answer. It's good practice, but if you want to keep watching, that's fine too. So pause it now if you're going to. Otherwise, here's the pathway. So, some terminology first. Because the blue bunny is farther upstream than the white bunny, the blue one is said to be epistatic to the white, while the white one is said to be hypostatic to the blue. So to get nine red, there has to be at least one dominant B1 allele and at least one dominant B2 allele. Now I have here shown that these genes lead to enzymes 1 and 2, which is often how genes code in nature. To get white, there has to be at least one dominant B1 allele, but the B2 have to be homozygous recessive to make the pathway stop at white. If it doesn't stop there, then the pathway goes all the way to red. To get blue, all that matters is being homozygous recessive for B1. It is irrelevant what genotype the bunny is for B2 because the pathway will have stopped at blue because enzyme 1 was never produced. And given that homozygous recessive for B1 occurs one quarter of the time, four out of the 16 bunnies will be blue. And that's how you get 9 to 3 to 4 instead of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. Dominant epistasis is the flip side of the coin. One of the threes joined the nine to give a 12 to 3 to 1 ratio. So just like with recessive epistasis, pause the video if you want to figure out the pathway on your own. Otherwise, here's how it works. Red, white, and blue. For the pathway to go to completion, all the way to blue, both B1 and B2 must be homozygous recessive so that both enzymes 1 and 2 can be made. Now, as I've done it here, B1 codes for enzyme 2, which appears second, so don't get confused, it wasn't that way with recessive epistasis. If the bunny is homozygous recessive for B2, but there's at least one dominant B1 allele, then the pathway will stop at white. And finally, if the bunny has at least one dominant B2 allele, it doesn't matter what genotype the bunny is for B1, as the pathway stops at red. So that's dominant epistasis. Our last ratio here of 2 to 1 would suggest lethal alleles. We have two heterozygous dominant bunnies, and when crossed, their offspring are 2 to 1, red to white. Why aren't we seeing the normal 3 to 1? What's happening is that the homozygous dominant genotype is fatal. At some point in development, things go awry and the red bunny dies. What this implies also is that any red bunny you see must be heterozygous. This happens in humans. Certain forms of dwarfism, uh, chondroplasia for example, are dominant, caused by a mutant allele, but every little person you see is heterozygous because a double dose of the dominant allele is lethal. This also explains why little people could have normal sized children. Now, this ratio suggests that the double dose is fatal at some point in development, but there are certain diseases, diseases that are fatal with a double dose but don't rear their heads until middle age. These really wouldn't have much of an effect. Uh, in humans anyway, on the fitness of the individual, and all the offspring would be carriers of the mutant gene. If you get a question on the MCAT dealing with lethal alleles, pay attention to when it causes death. Okay, some other deviations from Mendelian genetics you should know about are incomplete dominance and co-dominance. All of these bunnies are homozygous, and when red is incompletely dominant to white, the offspring will all be pink. There will be an average or a mix of the two parental phenotypes. You see this a lot in flowers. Codominance, on the other hand, would result in offspring that are both red and white. It's not a mix, but each parental phenotype is equally expressed. This happens when you have two alleles that are dominant to a third. In our case, let's say that third bunny is blue. Uh, you see this in our ABO blood types. 
A and B are both dominant to O, but are co-dominant with each other. That's how you get type AB. And that's also how I remember the distinction between incomplete dominance and co-dominance. Blood equals co-dominant. And finally, we have penetrance and expressivity. Think about both of these as to what extent genes are expressed in the phenotype. The distinction between them, though, is that penetrance is for the population, two Ps, nice mnemonic. And for expressivity, it's the individual. Now, what I mean by that for penetrance is if the bunny has the gene for red, is it actually red? In this example, all of these bunnies have the gene for red, but only five-sixths of them are expressing that. Therefore, the gene is about 83% penetrant. Genetic disorders in humans are classified this way. If all individuals in the population who have the gene have the disorder, it is said to be fully penetrant. If most of them who have the gene have the disorder, it is said to be highly penetrant. Expressivity, on the other hand, would look something like this. All of these bunnies have the gene for red, but they vary in how red they are. They each have different expressivities. This explains why the same breed of dogs, like beagles, can have such varied coat coloration. They're expressing the gene for their coat color at varying levels. For genetic disorders, the difference would be in how symptomatic an individual is. If you have all the symptoms of the disorder, that's highly expressive. If you have just a few or none, then it's weakly expre expressive. So that's it for part one. Here are a few questions. Pause the video while you work on them, as the answer slide will appear in about five seconds, so pause it now. And here are the answers. Feel free to leave a comment about the questions or anything in this video, and pause again here if you'd like more time to review. Okay, so get the basics and ratios down. Part two is up next, so follow the link to sex linkage, pedigree analysis, and risk analysis.